It is my pleasure to introduce Simon Baptist. Simon is the Global Chief Economist at the Economist Intelligence Unit and is currently based in Singapore. He is also the Managing Director of the EIU in Asia with oversight for the EIU's research, consultancy, and C-suite advisory services in the region. Simon has a doctorate in economics from Oxford University, where he was also a lecturer, along with a degrees in economics and science at the University of Tasmania. His academic research investigated technology and the determinants of productivity in manufacturing firms. Uh, something that we should do a different fireside chat with about one of these days, Simon. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> hi, Simon. Thank you for joining the fireside chat. Hi, Timo. Good to be here. Great to have you. Okay, so let's get going. Uh, we will start with a fairly open-ended question and take as much time as you need to address that, which is characterize how 2020 ended and how the beginning of 2021 is shaping up. Interestingly, after a very tumultuous year, I think the word that best describes where we're sitting at the end of 2020 is uh, optimism, uh, in a sense, because December is when we got some uh, good progress news on vaccines. Uh, markets have certainly taken that to heart and continued their, uh, continued their roaring, uh, roaring valuations on the assumption that the global rollout of vaccines is going to lead to economies coming uh, back sooner rather than later. But of course, uh, I'll come back to, to whether I think that that vaccine optimism is quite, uh, is quite justified or how that's going to play out. I mean, 2020 was a year of incredible uh, economic disruption and declines in GDP. A lot of economies had historically large declines in GDP, uh, more than in the 08-09 recession, more than in the Asian financial crisis, uh, more than in the tech crash uh, of 2001. So it was a very, very uh, notable year around the world. The big exception, uh, for economies uh, in terms of not shrinking uh, is China. It was the only large economy that didn't shrink in 2020. We had the Q4 GDP data out earlier uh, in the week, and it did show that China's economy grew by 2.3% uh, in 2020. Picture looks a little bit muddled. There were quite a lot of historical revisions uh, of the quarterly GDP figures for China. So um, our team is looking into uh, at the EIU right now, what we think about those and uh, what, the, what the real underlying picture is. We were expecting 1.9%, uh, which would have been without the historical revisions. But nonetheless, I mean, something around 2% uh, growth for China. Now, it's much less than what China has been used to. Chinese growth prior to that was running at about 6%, um, but it was better than uh, any other large economy managed to achieve. Other economies that did really well, uh, Bangladesh, Egypt, Vietnam, also managed to grow, um, although again, like China, much lower than they, uh, than they had beforehand. So there, East Asia overall was the bright spot, um, if we could say there was one through 2020. Latin America, India and Europe, the three regions that bore the brunt of the COVID-19 economic disruption, uh, economies in those regions all shrinking by uh, between 8 and 10 percent on average. So some very, very large GDP declines uh, through, through those regions. Looking ahead to 2021, and we're very focused on what is the recovery going to look like. And I think in 2021, it's going to be really critical not to look at economic data in isolation. We're going to get a lot of data releases uh, with, you know, very strong looking GDP growth rates. Um, but of course, the context for a lot of these where have economies come from? Uh, Peru is going to be one of the world's fastest growing economies in uh, 2021. Actually, I've got a, uh, we have a look on our slide two or the slide on 2021 GDP growth. We can put that up. It'll show you the EIU's uh, forecast for growth in different economies next year. Uh, Peru, one of the world's fastest growing economies. The here economies in red growing much faster, but it's only because Peru I had such a bad uh, 2020. So this slide we're looking at now actually shows if we average the growth rate over 2020 and 2021, so we're looking at the rebound um, to, to get the, that nets out to get the underlying picture. This really shows more the underlying health of the economies. And when you see economic data this year, um, do look at last year's number as well to see where it's come from. Uh, through the Simon, whole sorry, years, Simon, I'm, gonna, 
Yeah. I'm going to interrupt you for just a second because it's such an interesting chart. I just want to make one observation. So those who are mm. looking at this chart, see all these colors. It basically means that if you're not red, you're basically going to have negative over the two years, meaning your GDP in the end of 2021 would still yeah. be lower than at the beginning of 2020. That's right. Yes. And uh, the two countries in here that sit on the zero mark are um, Turkey, which is TR, kind of in the middle, and then Papua New Guinea, PG, down in the bottom right. So anything more blue than Turkey or Papua New Guinea is not recovering back to where it was uh, by the end of 2021. And in fact, that is true for most economies. Um, if we look at economies on this chart, China is already back to where it was. Through next year, um, some of the emerging markets are going to get back. So Indonesia, uh, Korea and Turkey, for example. But it's not going to be till 2022 or 2023 that most economies get back to where they were. And some, uh, such as Japan, Mexico, Italy, are going to take even until 2024 to recover where they were. Um, on the next slide, actually, I have a, uh, a chart showing when I think different economies are going to get back to where they were. So I won't read, I won't read all the list out, but this is the, uh, the flags of the G20 economies and when we at the EIU think they'll recover uh, to where they were. Great. Um, all right, so if we can sort of take stock of what you just said, and I think that is critical importance because economies worry a lot about sort of long-term scarring, that if you stay in right. contractionary territory for a long time, um, the risk of, you know, things remaining bad even increases further. And what you're showing here, I mean, starkly showing, you know, how China is sort of making up for ground very quickly, whereas you know, we have a few countries that basically look at least half a decade of lost output. Uh, and, and that is stark. So, yeah, very nice visualization. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the big determinant of growth in our part of the world is trade and commerce. And so maybe, you know, to some extent, you know, how the rest of the world does is very important for Asia. Uh, and in the past, of course, you know, Asia has grown by exporting to the U.S. and Europe uh, primarily and the rest of the world as well. But U.S. EU demand were the most important determinant of Asian growth cycles. Is it going to be the same this year? Are we hostage to U.S. EU or has China become much more important uh, for the outlook for Asia? For most Asian economies, it will continue to be the US and Europe that are more important determinants of export recovery. And the big reason for this uh, is that China's recovery has really been driven by its own exports. Um, so in fact, um, China, which you know, is a competitor with a lot of Southeast Asian economies in many sectors, such as uh, electronics and textiles and assembly, um, chemicals, uh, China is, in fact, doing the running at increasing its market share of global exports. It really had its recovery driven um, by the industrial sector. Of course, in industry, generally, it's easier to deal with distancing measures. Uh, you can automate uh, facilities more effectively, and also you can stockpile output. So even while uh, logistics are disrupted, your factories can keep going, uh, and then you can sort of pump the, the product out onto global markets once uh, once logistics open up again. And this is, in fact, what happened in China. Big rises in inventories uh, in um, Q2, Q3, uh, and then a big increase in exports through Q3, Q4. So China's underlying picture is a bit weaker than the GDP number suggests because a bunch of it is, uh, is, due to rising, is due to rising exports. Now, some of this is, uh, um, firstly, it's a, the, the inventories kind of story, but it is also that China does have a strong position in many sectors where growth has gone up uh, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is things like um, personal protection equipment and healthcare consumables. Um, China is a big exporter of those. Um, pharma, pharmaceutical and medical exports have done well, um, as, uh, as have exports of electronic products where people have been sort of uh, either just stocking up on electronic goods, either for entertainment or for, or for work at home purposes. So that's been part of the driving factor as well. But the fact that China is exporting so much more, it had a record trade surplus in December, that does mean that it's not providing support to the rest of the world like it did in 2009, 2010, after the last big crisis. Back then, China was sucking in imports, China's growth, very heavily investment led. It was buying a lot of commodities. So especially for those commodity exporting economies um, around the region, around the world, 
uh, it was a big driver of recovery. This time, it's not going to be quite like that. Uh, we are going to have to, in Southeast Asia, really look to Europe and US consumer demand to recover. Consumer demand in China is also still very, very weak. Um, there have been some, again, some historic revisions to the data, but private consumption in China is going to grow in 2020 only by something like 0.7%, so much less than even the kind of meagre 2.3% growth that came out. So that consumer growth and the ex therefore that flows out to exports of other countries um, is going to remain pretty flat. I think in Southeast Asia, opportunities are going to come, I mean, primarily um, from getting domestic economies restarted and getting the pandemic under control. I mean, this is something that Malaysia and Thailand are kind of uh, experiencing now where uh, the uh, one shoe um, have infections coming back and you have to reimpose movement control or lockdown measures, then you have uh, big declines in economic activity. So that's where the key action is. In a more strategic sense, I think there's also a lot going on with readjustment of supply chains. With That's a bright spot for Southeast Asia. It's a, it's a net winner uh, from the US-China trade war as it can benefit from both sides looking to relocate supply chains from the other. So, uh, Simon, the point that you made about countries like Malaysia and Thailand struggling with flaring up of infection is a very critical one because, as you said, uh, China is growing well, but it is doing a lot of domestic circulation as far as the drivers of growth are concerned. China exports a lot of tourism, but if you right. know, your country has serious COVID problems, then that tourism is not going to come to your country. And the Chinese are yeah. going to basically going to go visit various parts in China. And, you know, there is a lot of domestic yeah. tourism happening there but they're not it's going really, anywhere in the world. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. that's a very big source of concern. And one can only hope that, you know, in three to six months time, as vaccination becomes more widespread, countries will be able to open up their borders to some extent toward tourism, particularly with Chinese tourism in mind. Uh, short of that, I think retailers worldwide, uh, especially in Asia, but elsewhere as well, are in big trouble. Yeah, I mean, there's been some shifts, of course, in um, tourism-related spending. So if we look at the, the luxury goods industry, so domestic spending in China has risen massively on those kinds of goods because previously Chinese tourists would go abroad to avoid the luxury tax on the mainland, um, going to uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, Thailand, anywhere uh, to buy uh, to buy luxury goods. Now, of course, they're being bought domestically. Uh, and so the luxury firms, they've seen huge growth in the China market. I think tourism is going to be a long way off uh, in terms of being a, a good economic driver. And for countries like Thailand, this poses a really serious structural challenge um, because it was a big part of, uh, of Thailand's, uh, Thailand's model. I mean, as far as vaccines go, we're starting to see rollout of vaccines now, um, but I think it's gonna be a lot slower than um, commentary or you know markets are. Expecting so we've in in the US the EU um, we should see key workers so healthcare workers or whatnot vaccinated by the end of March but we're not going to get widespread vaccinations where we say we're getting to a point where 60 or 70 percent of the population are covered um, I think until September at the absolute best um, probably more like October November now outside of the US and the EU which have got the fastest um, apart from a couple of other small countries like UAE and Israel um, that have got the uh, the fastest trajectories in, in most of uh, Asia so um, China Australia uh, South Korea uh, it's going to be um, not till the very end of this year or the beginning of 2022 that we get to that point where 70% are vaccinated. Um, and it's not going to be till after then that uh, all the distancing measures are going to be able uh, to be relaxed. And we've seen in, uh, in Singapore where the government here, for example, has had a very um, risk averse approach uh, to, to opening up, even though we've had um, I mean, all, all, all but no COVID circulating um, outside of people on stay-at-home notice for such a long time. But that kind of indicates that I think governments, particularly in places where the pandemic has been controlled, are going to be very um, reticent to open up. And so they're going to want to wait till we countries do get to that 80% or, or whatever vaccination. So this means for us, um, probably very few people coming in um, and it being hard to get back in if you've gone out. And then countries like New Zealand or Australia or Taiwan 
um, that or Vietnam that have controlled the pandemic well, they are probably not going to want anybody to come in until they've reached those milestones of almost universal domestic vaccination, even if say more people in Singapore uh, were vaccinated. So I think uh, it's a long way of saying I think the uh, vaccine is a positive um, thing on the that's the light at the end of the tunnel, but it's going to take time to um, just get through the logistics of vaccinating billions of people until we get to a point where things can open up again. Absolutely. Simon, the irony that I have in mind is that at some point late this year, countries will be opening up to Chinese tourism because a very large part of the Chinese would be vaccinated. Uh, so they were the first ones that we banned from coming and they'll be the first ones that will be allowed to come. Uh, but uh, but again, that also depends on efficacy and the the uh, you know space, pace with which China also manages to vaccinate its own population. Um, right. Now, staying with the uh, sort of the growth outlook and the exports issue, one important issue is of course uh, the exchange rate. I mean, in the past, I remember right after the Asian financial crisis in ninety eight ninety nine. Uh, when Asian economies went through substantial depreciation, uh, their exports did very, very well. Uh, and they right. sort of rode that uh, uh, exchange rate based stabilization uh, following the depreciation uh, through exports and did very well. Now, of course, we are seeing a bit of a weird uh, narrative. For the last couple of months, we've seen steady decline in the US dollar, which has accelerated from the mild trend that we saw in Q1, Q2 last year. And, mm -hmm. and now in these Middle of January this year, you know, people are sort of, you know, in two minds. If inflation comes in the U.S., long-term rates will go up. That could lead to risk aversion and dollar strengthening, or we could have the current trend continuing and continued weakness in dollar. So first, share with us your view on the dollar. And secondly, what does that mean for Asia's uh, outlook? Right. Yeah, I've got some uh, chart here I prepared about currencies and what uh, what what we're forecasting for the next while. Overall, I think the period of US dollar weakness that we've had is over. Um, so the US dollar um, has already depreciated quite a lot through 2020. Um, I think in general that that universal week period of universal weakness um, has finished, but of course, currency by currency, there will um, be some getting stronger and some getting weaker. So this chart is rebased to 2020 Q4. That's where all the lines cross over together in the middle. Uh, and when the lines go up, that's the currency appreciating. So um, Singapore, uh, Singapore dollar is there in uh, in in a mid grey kind of colour. Actually, one of the most stable ones, of course, because uh, MAS um, essentially manages monetary policy here through the exchange rate. So that's that's kind of been a been a, a managed um, managed stability there. But you can see some really interesting trends of COVID through this. So you look on the left hand side, you can see that deep dark grey line going down. Um, that was the uh, Australian dollar um, plummeting at the start of 2020 um, as exposure to China looked like being a huge weakness, right? So that's when we thought the COVID pandemic um, was going to be concentrated in China, probably wouldn't go around elsewhere so much. So the Australian currency fell uh, because everybody assumed that meant that ex Australian exports, which are very China dependent, would drop. Then suddenly in Q2, there was this huge bounce back as uh, suddenly Australia's exposure to China looked like a big plus um, rather than a big minus. And then added on to that through the latter half of 2020, as it became clear that Australia was one of the better countries uh, dealing with the pandemic, the Australian dollar recovered well beyond its pre-pandemic position. And we think actually that's going to continue. You'll see amongst the Asian currencies um, uh, and the key global ones I've got up here, we do see the Aussie dollar having the most amount of strength over the next while. So, I mean, for investors in Singapore, that would mean that um, uh, investing in Australian assets or the Australian stock market um, is going to get a little bit of an extra bump in the returns through that uh, through that currency strength. Um, although the Singapore dollar is the one that we think will remain the second strongest of these eight that I've got up here. But through the second half of 2020, all of the lines are, um, with the exception of Indonesia's, are pointing upwards, which means those currencies are going up against the US dollar. So that's that US dollar weakness. What do we see coming from here? It really depends on different countries' growth prospects um, and what, uh, of course, central banks are doing in terms of interest rates. Um, so Australian economic performance should be relatively strong and interest rates being relatively higher as a result as compared to, uh, to a lot of the other um, major developed world currencies. Uh, on the other hand, the Indonesian rupiah, we see quite uh, a bit more uh, a bit more weakness 
uh, in that currency is the economy. Um, there's a very, a very large, uh, very large outbreak there. But as the central bank is sort of not able to adjust um, interest rates as it would quite like to, um, as a result of uh, souring investor sentiment, the Korean won has strengthened quite a lot, um, as has the Japanese yen. Uh, we see both of those being relatively stable, along with the euro, um, for uh, for the next year and a half. So that's that's the picture that we see coming uh, for uh, for currencies. I mean, you know, the chart is striking, uh, especially with Indonesia slated to weaken further. Uh, you know, you mentioned in your in your bullet on the slide that you know lower yields and the rich world shifts focus to EM. Now, Indonesia is a famously known positive high yielder. Why wouldn't they benefit from that? Yeah, it's really to do with in, with uh, with risk aversion um, sentiment, where uh, you know, the Indonesian policy response to COVID nineteen has been. Um, relatively, or well, has been has been very ineffective, and so the pandemic there is uh, is pretty much out of control. There's a little bit of nervousness, I think, creeping in as well um, with the upcoming um, as we get closer and closer to the next uh, presidential election. And we know that uh, in Indonesia, while things can look a bit stable a year out from a year out from the election, but uh, like in recent years in Malaysia, those those seemingly very large coalitions, it probably looks like he's got a huge coalition in parliament. Right now, but he's uh, he's got that because um, he has resources to throw around, and so there may be an increase in uh, in political instability uh, leading up to leading up to that election. Interesting. And you mentioned that you know, in general, by comparison with other EM uh, countries, you know, Asian currencies will fare better. Um, do you expect currency crisis type situation in LATAM or EMEA? Yes, I mean there are some economies that are very much at risk of that. Um, I mean, in a way, it's the uh, it's the usual suspect. So the uh, the three I'd be worried about from a systemic perspective um, would be Turkey, uh, South Africa, and Brazil. So they are the three um, where there are still substantial depreciatory pressures on the currency. I mean, the lira in Turkey is already down. I mean, I've, I've lost, even lost track of the percentage. What is it? Like down 50% from where it was kind of two years ago. And that's, that process probably still has further, um, still has further to run. Uh, South Africa, uh, likewise, currency has gone down a lot. Um, but I think that weakness is going to persist. Now, um, especially where you combine it with the current account deficits in all of those countries um, and the for policy making and um, uh, and again the the investor kind of uh, risk aversion coming back a bit as there's more certainty um, around what's happening in different economies. I, I think those are the places that I don't think any of them will have a crisis. It's not my core projection. Whereas I mean I, we've already had some crises in places like um, Ecuador uh, or Zambia. So there have been some small economies that have ha already defaulted on their sovereign debt and had currency prices. And there'll be a few more of those, I think, in, in Central Asia, um, perhaps uh, some of the smaller Latin ones and certainly a handful in Africa. Those big economies, I think, should last without, uh, um, without a crisis, but it will be at the cost of um, further pressure on the currencies. And then um, that's going to have an impact on living standards as it will raise uh, the prices of uh, of imported uh, imported goods. Sounds like you wouldn't be too worried about turbulence elsewhere having a spillover impact in Asia, as far as EM is concerned. Asian EM, I think, is quite insulated in 2021 because of the generally good performance of uh, of economies in terms of controlling the COVID-19 pandemic. Clearly, some exceptions: Indonesia, Philippines. And India have all done very badly uh, in terms of controlling the pandemic, and they're all having um, actually Philippines and India having very large economic contractions as a result. Actually, Indonesia's economy has held up um, held up a little bit uh, a little bit better, but I think at the expense of sort of long term uh, long term health uh, health impacts and a much slower opening up of things. Of things like tourism, but East and Southeast Asia have uh, performed very strongly with uh, with their COVID response. That's going to put them well placed to open up again, and, and hence we've seen things like this appreciation uh, in the Korean in the Korean won uh, and the Korean stock market. Just I mean, like like others, um, has just hit uh, just hit a record high um, because not only um, 
the currency looking good, but also the economy is looking good and domestic spending is able to is able to start up again. Okay, so I, I was going to ask you about a couple of more EM questions, but since you mentioned the fact that you know Korean stock market is doing well, well, Simon, the glaring fact is stock markets are doing well everywhere. Uh, it seems almost like bifurcated from the economic reality. I mean, you pointed out earlier right. that even 2021 is not going to be a smooth ride. We can't just expect that you know the vaccination to cure all in a short period of time. Whereas you right. know the equity markets seem to be you know at a at a whole different. Uh, a level of thinking. So is that irrational? Is that a bubble? Or you see method in that madness? It all depends on your views on inflation and where central banks are going to have to go with interest rates. So certainly valuations um, have broken away from where they were in 2019. So the gap between um, expected earnings and stock prices is uh, is much higher than it was, and so the you know the PE ratios are, are much much higher. So in that sense, stock markets in general are looking very overvalued, I mean, particularly in uh, in some places like say China, where there are some systemic kind of issues coming from the tensions uh, with the US. And so there 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 are the valuations are absolutely stretched, but it makes sense if you think interest rates are permanently lower. Um, because then, of course, the, the discounted present value of your of your dividends or your cash flow uh, is worth a lot more than than it is um, than it was beforehand. So this becomes the key question: What do I think is going to happen to interest rates? I actually, do think they are going to stay low um, in the big economies. So in places like you know, US, um, Europe, Japan, um, UK, the major kind of central bank interest rates, I think, are going to sit. Um, at where they are now, which is basically at zero, um, all the way through 2021 um, and most of 2022 um, for all of them as well. Probably some uh, like the UK might be first to to tighten slightly, but places like Japan and the ECB, I don't think they'll move well. Probably not for the next five years, right? I mean, they've both had zero interest rates for a long time anyway. Central banks have kind of shown through this crisis that they're not finished with ammunition, even though interest rates are very low. They've um, you know, used a lot of other other techniques, other yield curve, curve management, and places like uh, that have never done it before have gone into QE. So Australia is an is an example of that. So as long as central banks keep things very loose, um, then on a re relative return basis, stock markets look reasonably uh, reasonably valued. And then of course you've got the liquidity support as well. And interestingly, um, property markets have also been performing pretty strongly in uh, again most places around the world, despite the fact that there are these huge questions over commercial real estate and the extent to which that will come back. And I think we still probably don't quite know the full answer to that. Um, uh, my assumption would be that in the end, um, we're going to probably only have around two, uh, no more than two thirds as many people every day going to the office. Um, some people are gonna have to go back full time, but for those that don't need to, uh, I think something like 50-50 is gonna be more uh, more like the the, the norm, um, and once vaccines are out and distancing measures are released, that will end up in a net reduction in needed office space. That's a huge asset class. Um, but despite that, the relative returns on offer from um, from rentals, which tend to be much less volatile, um, say than than stock prices, um, has kept money flowing in to all sorts of assets, not uh, not just stock markets. So, which group are you in? The two thirds or the one thirds in terms of going back to office? <laughs> I'm uh, I'm definitely in the not going back to the office uh, pile. Actually, at the uh, at the Economist Intelligence Unit, we already uh, luckily actually had a very very um, uh, I guess generous or uh, yeah generous uh, work at home policy beforehand. So we were already slightly work at home um, even before the pandemic. So luckily our systems were all uh, were already. But yeah, if you're in a job like mine, which is uh, you know desk base, data analysis, um, you know, there's there's little need to be in the office except for collaboration with colleagues. So I think, you know, I'll, I'll be going into um, coordinating with my teams to go in on the same days to, you know, I guess do creative work together um, or to have strategy sessions or just to um, build bonds uh, and, and continue to, to know each other once a week or whatnot. But day to day, uh, I think if you're in a job like uh, a job like mine or perhaps like most people's on this call, um, we probably will be in the office. Now, that doesn't apply to everybody. Um, there's a lot of people in jobs where, where they can't be done 
can't be done remotely. So that's why I think there won't be a collapse in in uh, in office space. But I think it is going to be quite a big shift. Right. Right. No, absolutely. I mean, the the need for physical interaction is certainly there. But to what extent we have a permanent shift in staying at home versus a temporary shift I think is a great big question going forward. That one, I want yeah. to stay with inflation a little longer uh, because that's a big thing for the markets right now. But when I look at the macro landscape, on one hand, I see a lot of slack. And as you pointed out through your charts that, you know, many countries will not see real GDP levels being revisited pre-COVID levels till the end of this year, maybe 2020 to 2023. So that is certainly not a case for inflation. On the other hand, you know, bank credit has certainly been expanding, uh, unlike the way they did, uh, uh, they contracted after the GFC or the European crisis, they're actually expanding this time. So credit intermediation is taking place. We have a lot of cash on people's hands because fiscal and monetary measures have been much more generous. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have some strange COVID-related supply side disruption. As a result, we're seeing shipping freight rates go through the roof. Uh, if you go to Amazon.com, you can't find a bike for six months unless you're willing to pay a premium. So it seems yeah. like you know there are a couple of ingredients uh, in place with respect to uh, having the wherewithal to spend, not enough supply, as well as banks being a player in this rebound as opposed to they were in 2010, 2011. So those right. arguments are on the other side, that there could be some inflation around the corner. So net-net, where do you stand? Um, net net um, for the developed world, I'm in the low inflation camp. But it's worth remembering that in many emerging markets, inflation is actually quite high at the moment. So in China, it's been quite high because of the um, you know the big increase in pork prices over the last kind of 18 months or so. India inflation is very high, um, particularly food prices have been going up. And this this and it's, in cases like India, it's because their supply chains have been much less resilient. So there have been more supply, there have been more supply effects. Um, and so that's meant that uh, inflation has gone up. But in places like, uh, I mean, let's focus on the US, which is this chart that's up. That's up now. It is, um, I guess, the biggest driver of global kind of inflationary pressures. I do see those going slowly. Um, it, the amount of slack in the economy from underutilized labor resources is just high enough that I think um, it can cope with quite a lot of uh, on stimulus measures before it shows up uh, in goods inflation. Now it's showing up in asset price inflation, right? So that's where the liquidity is going, not into transactions. Um, it's going into it's going into markets. And the response of a lot of firms through this crisis has been to automate and to digitize. Yep. So the shift to e-commerce was already fast, but it's been massively accelerated. Um, companies where they had the cash flow have accelerated. Uh, automation plans in the manufacturing sector or even in the services sector. Um, so that's going to lead to a long-term decrease in demand for labour uh, amongst those firms. And they'll keep the slack there for a while. But, I mean, I agree with you. There are some upside risks. I listed a bunch of them here. And actually, time yeah, you seven of them. <laughs> already. Um, and so, yeah, so there are reasons to worry about inflation. Now, it's not my core view that inflation is going to, you know, I guess sort of get above the sort of 2% kind of threshold in the developed world that would mark central banks taking serious action, um, but it is, it could happen. I guess there's, say, a, I don't know, a, um, something like a 25% chance of that happening because there are a lot of factors that could, that, could, uh, that could spur it. And if that happens, that will be a big problem for global financial stability. Debt levels in, um, in the, in mostly in developed markets or countries that have got the fiscal space, so including places like Malaysia, Thailand, and Singapore uh, in, in this region, their debt has massively increased. Now, those repayments are affordable as long as the yields on sovereign bonds are so low, right? And uh, so central banks are going to be trying to keep interest rates at zero um, to maintain their financial stability mandate. Um, as long as they can keep doing that, I think the house of cards can stay up. But if interest rates do go up, then the repayment burden um, of uh, these countries that have massively increased their debt, which is most countries that can, that, that were able to, um, did so, that would then be a financial stability issue. So I think watching inflation um, is going to be uh, one of the most important things to keep an eye on um, for markets, but also the real economy uh, over the next couple of years. No, absolutely. I think, you know, we sometimes are lulled by the fact that inflation has been low for so long and interest rates have been on a gradual declining path in the developed markets for so long that we forget 
how destabilizing, you know, you know, rise in inflation can be with respect to debt sustainability. Even the U.S., mm -hmm. which sort of prints its own money, at the end of the day, has to service the debt. So the interest payment as a share of GDP uh, right now is extremely low. But if it doesn't stay low, uh, it would crowd out other spending. And as you can see from the incoming Biden administration's plans, there are lots of plans for spending in a variety of areas. I'll, I'll come back to that in a second uh, when we talk about, you know, sort of. Uh, spending plans for the future. But I just want to stay with China momentarily, uh, RMB. So on one hand, you know, we had the weak dollar narrative and the flip side of that was a stronger RMB narrative in the second half of last year. And China is doing all sorts of things. A couple of years ago, the buzzword was the internationalization of the RMB and then the SGR inclusion. These days, it's all about the ERMB initiative. So what is the thinking on the Chinese side with respect to their currency? Mm. It's, I mean, it's confused as it always has been. Right? China is uh, is torn on one hand between a, a, a kind of political mantra of wanting to be a global currency and not wanting to be reliant on the U.S. dollar for international transactions in the financial system, um, but then the contradiction on the other hand is a lack of willingness to cede control uh, over currency movements because you can't internationalize your currency. Uh, if you keep your capital account closed. And so the RMB convertible, the current account for things like trade, but not convertible on the capital account for things like uh, things like investment. And companies do actually have trouble with things like profit repatriation um, out of China. And of course, you know, uh, um, uh, a skill that uh, is in uh, high supply within China is uh, amongst households is ways to evade capital controls. <laughs> But uh, they can't do it to the extent that they would um, that they would really like to. So I think uh, control is going to dominate. Um, so despite the rhetoric about internationalisation, um, I, I think control is going to be a more important factor. In that sense, I don't see the RMB becoming really widely used for international transactions, um, uh, even in in bilateral trade with uh, with China. The only countries that will uh, uh, happy to, to use RMB with China or places like Iran and Russia, um, but China doesn't really want a big supply of um, Iranian or Russian currency. So um, I think the internationalization is going to be is going to be quite slow. Um, the big driver of RMB strength has been um, alongside the resurgence in goods exports, but it's actually the service that the, the services exports, or I guess the collapse in services imports, um, that has made a big difference. I mean, Chinese. Tourism spending abroad in 2019 was huge and had been growing very fast. It all but ate up China's surplus in goods. So the trade surplus in goods basically eaten up by the amount of money that Chinese tourists were spending abroad. And that's completely gone. That's now a huge amount of RMB that is not being converted into foreign currencies. So that's a big um, uh, reduction in the demand for foreign currencies vis-a-vis -vis RMB. So hence, uh, hence that RMB strength, right? So it's gone from um, you know, breaking the magic seven, which excited us all um, about 18 months, uh, 18 months ago, um, to now sitting, you know, kind of 6.6, 6.6, 6.7, and probably that's where uh, where it's kind of going to going to going to stay for a while. You, you right. also know, the ERB, that's a very interesting initiative, and I think China is likely to be the first place that does a proper digital currency. Um, why have digital currencies been a bit slow to come? I mean, firstly, central banks tend to be conservative, and you know, it's a new it's a new kind of measure, um, but the biggest issue has been that in a lot of places, not everyone has access to a digital wallet, um, and so you, it's difficult to make something um, legal tender if it's not something that everybody uh, that everybody can use. So there are sort of sort of some ethical um, or philosophical issues uh, within that. Um, but of course, for China, with the, the big share of payments already that are done online, so things like WeChat Pay and Alipay. Um, that means that those sort of barriers are much lower in China. Plus also, if the government there wants to do something, I mean, it will just do so. And if uh, if some people are kind of sidelined by it, they'll be less, they'll be less worried about that. So politically, it's easier for them to push through. Um, they also will be very happy with the loss of privacy that a digital currency would entail. So the government would then be able to know exactly who is spending what on what, um, whereas cash is, uh, cash is still one of the few ways in a financial sense where we can uh, we can keep our transactions to ourselves. Um, so in China, I think the uh, the fact that everyone's already got an e-wallet 
um, that uh, and the privacy concerns are less relevant, they'll probably be one of the first to do it. And once governments start doing digital currencies, I think that is going to really put an end to any prospect of, of which I don't think there is any anyway um, of something like Bitcoin or, or, or other um, other digital, so, you know, blockchain-based digital currencies um, becoming widespread, uh, wide, widespread means of transactions and widespread accepted. So while there's no alternative, um, you know, Bitcoin kind of has has a purpose, although its its functional purpose is mostly for um, things like evading capital controls or illegal activities, so like drugs or gambling or or what? No, no, there'll always be a space for that, right? I mean, there, there's uh, there's always been quite a big uh, big black market and all sorts of things for as long as you know humans have ever had an economy. So I think that's there, there'll always be that kind of demand there, but it's going to be limited by the size of the the size of the black economy. But once as soon as central banks start doing something that's officially sanctioned, um, that that's where the transaction use of digital currencies will really come from. Right. I think the usability question is the one that has bedeviled uh, cryptocurrency substantially, and which is why I think the proponents of cryptocurrency have switched gear and they're talking about it as a store of value like gold as opposed to a challenge to you know fiat currency around the world. Damon, I had a few other questions, but I can't ask them because we have more than half a dozen questions from the audience. So okay. let's, go to, let's go to them. Uh, I think the way yeah. I'm going to do it is put them on the screen. Uh, let's see if it's working. Uh, okay, I've made it active. So I don't know if it's showing. Okay, yeah. All right, so let's start with the one with two votes at the very bottom. Uh, I think this is about income inequality. What intergenerational differences are you seeing in the pandemic's impact on wealth? I mean, we won't know for a while, of course. Wealth data is quite hard to come across anyway, but the, the 2020 impact is is not going to be visible in the available statistics. But I think it's pretty clear what um, what the impact will be, which is it's going to be um, an increase in intergenerational inequality with older generations benefiting much more than younger. <laughs> There's two reasons for this. Uh, one is just older generations hold more assets um, because they've been saving for retirement through their working lives. And, uh, and so they've been the big beneficiaries of the increase in asset prices um, that we're seeing. So that's one reason why um, there's uh, an increase in inter intergenerational inequality. Um, secondly, it's also about job market opportunities. So the kind of service sector jobs that have been really highly affected in a lot of countries, so um, food and beverage, retail, uh, tourism, uh, hospitality related jobs, they're often um, how a lot of younger workers get their entry into the labour market. I mean, they, first develop skills. And so those opportunities not being available and often just being replaced with periods of unemployment, um, that's going to have lifetime uh, lifetime impacts on, on productivity and on earning potential. So um, yeah, I do see quite a strong generational difference in the medium term. Of course, ultimately, um, you know, assets are passed on as, as, uh, as generations, um, you know, as, as people die, with assets die and then pass it on to who, who they're, they're Heirs who are usually their usually their younger people or, or, or children who are younger than them. Um, the reason why that's going to have less of an impact on lifestyles is with rising life expectancy. So you know, for for most of us, um, uh, the people who are likely to be uh, leaving us something uh, in their in their bequests are probably going to be dying when we ourselves are in our sixties, and so. Um, by that point, we've already accumulated uh, our own kind of assets. So this aging process is actually a, a systematic increase in the permanent stock of investment assets um, because a lot of they sort of tend to then get passed on, uh, but by the time they get passed on, they don't need to be used. Right. So Simon, this is a question I think comes up at any place that you try to give a presentation, and uh, if you uh, you know, want to address it, you know, very briefly or, you know, with, with a great deal of detail, totally up to you. What are the top three trends to look out for in the next year or over the next five years? But I think some yeah. of the stuff that you've already talked about have covered it, but, you know, here you go again. Right. I mean, yeah, I mean, if, uh, if I was saying what are the top three things to watch, um, I mean, the first one is the um, pace and success of the vaccine rollout. Um, that's going to be a huge driver of, uh, of economies over the course of 2021-22. Um, I think uh, 
Another one is the inflation question. Now, I've already covered both of those, so let me bring up a couple of others um, in addition to that. I mean, one I didn't really mention um, is the US-China bifurcation, and I don't think markets are pricing that incorrectly, and I think companies are. I don't think companies are either. Um, the US-China tensions are not just about trade. Of course, they're much deeper than that, and they're not just about Trump. Uh, they're going to persist um, well in, you know, into the Biden administration and well beyond. Um, that as well. And we're seeing increasingly governments forcing companies to choose. And now companies don't want to choose between the US and China, um, but both those governments are going to try and force um, force companies to do so. So we've seen the US try and stop Huawei getting used, I mean, banning companies in its own jurisdiction from using Huawei, putting pressure on allies um, in Europe uh, or places like Australia not to use Huawei either, and actually, and successfully put pressure on them. On the other hand, China is now uh, passing laws making it a, a crime to comply with US sanctions, um, which of course is then going to put people in the position of either breaking Chinese law or breaking US law. Um, and, uh, and that's going to be a big increase in business costs. So I think that US-China bifurcation um, is, uh, is, is, is one key trend that I, I would have my eye on. It seems to me, Simon, that related to that, I think is the issue of uh, usability of euro or RMB using a different clearing mechanism than the one that the whole world is used to using with a SWIFT uh, based yeah. system because the weaponization of the US dollar certainly has given pause to countries that are also not very sympathetic to China but at the same time don't want to give up trading with China and don't want to get in trouble with the US by dealing mm. with uh, Chinese companies that might be in a blacklist with the US. So that's where I see the convergence of digital currency and fintech and politics all coming together and attempts by China to uh, make the RMB more usable on a cross-border basis. Maybe, you know, technology mm -hmm. will solve it for them when they have not been able to do it without it. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, uh, I mean, there certainly is pressure for that in certain places, but um, the, the reason why I think it won't be a big impact in the next, five, say, five years is that the countries that are interested, no one else is interested in them. So. Um, yeah, I Iran is happy to transact outside of SWIFT, but uh, nobody else is. And the risk for the US and the balance it's got to, got to play is that um, its power over SWIFT will be eroded the more it uses it. So um, it's a very powerful tool um, to you know, either exclude or threaten to exclude people from the, from the SWIFT system. And so um, since you nobody know will, will do anything if they think that that would be a possible consequence. But the more the US uses that, and I think Donald Trump was too quick to use that um, kind of threat in cases that didn't really um, justify its use, then you do line up more people. Uh, who are who are sort of willing to create alternative systems? So we'll probably see the first one happening um, between, say, you know, countries like uh, like uh, a bilateral between Russia and Iran, or maybe Russia, um, Russia, Iran, Turkey, perhaps. Right. Um, staying on with the uh, China-U.S. relationship. So the uh, next question mm -hmm. is related to the inauguration that's about to happen. Uh, do you think the China plus one policy will lose steam given the change in hands in the U.S. government? No, not at all. Um, in fact, it could even gain steam um, because it's likely that Biden is going to be more effective at uh, correlating allies together. So Japan, India, Australia um, in this region, but um, Europe, Canada as well in more of a united front against China. What does that mean, a united front against China? Um, it just means things like unified pressure on things like, uh, say, reciprocal treatment of, uh, of FDI and, um, and, and, and you know, the, the legal environment for FDI invested uh, firms. I think it means things like pressure on, um, on human rights uh, and then also on trying to achieve uh, goals such as environmental goals and climate change, probably one area where we could see some cooperation um, between China and the US coming. But that systematic approach is going to be more effective than Donald Trump's random approach. So, and we had under the, the Obama administration a time where the US policy was essentially um, very traditional and predictable and establishment led, um, but it was quite soft on China. Now, Trump has come in and was you know, unpredictable and um, extremely unpredictable, but also fairly ineffective because the trade deficit has kept, the US's trade deficit with China has, uh, has reached record levels um, through the Trump, um, through the Trump presidency. So um, a lot of sort of 
uh, light but not much heat from Trump. But that has changed the um, default positioning on the US, Democrat or Republican, to be more, much, much more anti-China. So if you combine the um, you know, sort of more establishment effectiveness of Obama's or you know the, or the Democrats' traditional approach with the um, the tougher China stance of Trump, that ends up being much more of a difficult position for China. So the wanting to diversify, which by the way both sides are doing it, Chinese firms also want to diversify away from the U.S. and away from U.S. allies. So it's a two it's a two sided street here, and this is the advantage for Southeast Asia because. Uh, it's got advantages in a lot of these critical sectors like electronics um, and semiconductors where there's uh, a lot of the political sensitivities. Also, a lot of um, synergies uh, with uh, the China's manufacturing base in the Pearl River Delta. Um, so very integrated supply chain. So a lot of component manufacturing in Southeast Asia being assembled in China, but also some competition as well and, and places like Malaysia, or the Philippines, or Thailand, Vietnam, we are seeing the electronic sector trying to get into those stages of the value chain that China was in before. So that China plus one policy, I think will be a plus for, uh, for Southeast Asia, um, even more so under Biden, because you're gonna make an investment decision not really based on Trump's tweet when you sort of think he might change his mind next week. Um, when there's a more systematic approach, I think there'll be a bigger impact on investment decisions. Um, related to that, uh, what about the fact that, you know, we have this uh, big agreement, uh, RCEP, and we have this uh, China-EU investment deal? So it seems like, you know, as 2020 came to an end, China scored yeah. a few symbolic victories at the very least uh, in terms of, you know, its uh, vision of globalization and its vision of taking down barriers and keeping supply chains on its side. Um, would that just be a big benefit for ASEAN, not necessarily for China? Um, I think both of those two agreements, there's much less than meets the eye to them. So, you know, on uh, the when our set was signed, we had the famous uh, Zoom Zoom shot of all of the uh, all the leaders in front of their flags signing it. Um, two days later, China started um, banning imports of Australian coal because it didn't like the political stance of the government. And so, um, you know, both signatories to to our set, and and that matter showed that. Uh, RCEP doesn't change the commitment of the countries in it to free trade, really. You know, places like China, like Indonesia, are uh, you know, not, not going to suddenly become free traders because of, uh, because of RCEP. And RCEP's also got no enforcement mechanisms. Um, countries will do what's mutually suitable. It's not to say RCEP is useless. Um, it might help uh, some administrative streamlining. I mean, it does sow the seed, um, I think, uh, in Northeast Asia, not so much with China, but more so bilaterally um, between uh, China, the, between Japan and uh, and South Korea. The EU deal as well, it, uh, it very much was symbolic um, in that China didn't really gain anything. Um, I mean, it, it got a commitment to get what it already had. It gave extra promises, but the history of China with, uh, with promises about regulation is uh, promises on paper, but then it's very hard to prove what's going on in such an opaque system. Um, and people who've taken the Chinese regulators to court in China don't have a very good history of winning, especially if they're, uh, especially if they're foreign firms. So um, I don't think those deals um, pretend a new free trade era. The one I'd be more excited about is CPTPP. That is a much more serious deal. Um, that is going to have uh, uh, substantial impact, say particularly um, areas like increasing Vietnam's access to Canada and Mexico, significant economies with which it didn't have great access before. And if places like, say, South Korea um, or the UK or Thailand um, came on board CPTPP, that would really cement its status um, as the, the new WTO and the, you know, the, uh, the important free trade agreement that will become the, um, the hub uh, for everything else to, to grow off over the next decade. Well, right after uh, RCEP was signed, we also heard Xi Jinping express interest that he wants to be also part of CPTPP. What do you think of that? Um, I want to say it will never happen. I mean, who wants to do I quite want to say never? I mean, I just can't see China ever signing up to the, the mutual enforcement mechanisms um, that's under CPTPP. And um, you know, the countries that were in it originally were, of course, people who were quite staunch free traders, places like Singapore, like New Zealand, 
um, like Chile, they are not going to want to weaken the agreement, even at the um, even at the expense of getting uh, of losing the chance to get China in it. I, I'd see the US as being more likely to come into it than China, but even that, I do not see at all on the agenda for for at least the next um, the next five years of Biden's presidency. Maybe after that, depending on how the the US political environment goes. We're beginning to run out of time, uh, Sam. And maybe one last question: um, Which country? in ASEAN seems the weakest link for this year? Um, the Philippines. Uh, it's, uh, it's had one of the, uh, the biggest reductions in, or it had one of the deepest, one of the deepest recessions. Um, unlike places like Singapore uh, and Thailand that have also had deep recessions, it hasn't managed to control the virus, which means its recovery uh, is going to be slow as well. Um, and it's, uh, quite heavy in the services industries that have been um, we're, we're, that are finding it harder to cope with the uh, with the distancing measures. So I think the Philippines has. All, I mean, 2020 was a terrible year, um, and I think it's going to be one of the slowest uh, to recover as well. Okay. All right. So thanks for the quick answer. That allows me to squeeze in one final question. This is related to ratings downgrade. So yeah. even as vaccine rollout gets underway and growth has troughed, uh, are there any yeah. rating downgrade risks? I think the direction of ratings changes is more likely to be up than down through 2021. There was a huge amount of downgrades uh, through um, through 2020, and there have been some defaults. Like there was an increase in defaults, of course. Um, I mentioned a few for Ecuador, Zambia, and a few others, Argentina. Um, so that was justified. But I think now the uncertainty has just reduced a lot. If we go back to October, we really didn't have a clear picture of how long this would go for, how bad it would get. Now we have a clearer picture of oh, the vaccine rollout's going to be slow. Looks like they work. We know it's coming. Um, and so uh, there's less uncertainty than there was, which is not to say the situation is fantastic, but we have a clearer picture of what's happening. So I think now that reduction in uncertainty is more likely to lead to um, to upgrades from where we are today. Great. I mean, that was a nice tour of the world. Thank you, Simon. Thanks so much for sharing your views. It was great talking to you. Thanks for the chat time. We'll see you later. Absolutely. And to our viewers, thank you. Uh, we hope our discussion has provided you with insights that will help you position your business as well as progress in 2021. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Stay healthy. Goodbye.